The ocean covers 70% of the globe. It gives us oxygen and food and millions of jobs. It brings joy and shapes our climate and weather. The ocean is life, and it belongs to everyone. Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is the world's independent leader in ocean discovery, exploration, and education, working to understand and sustain one of humanity's most precious common resources. Join us today for our ocean, our planet, and our future. Welcome to the Ocean Encounters virtual series from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, or HUI, as we like to call it for short. Tonight's presentation is Making Ocean Conservation Work, Combining Science, Community, and Policy for a Sustainable Future. HUI's Ocean Encounters online events are made possible by the Avatar Alliance Foundation and Dalio Philanthropies. Thank you. My name is Veronique LaCapra. I'll be your host for this evening. Before we hear from tonight's presenters, I'd like to take a minute to share some tips on how you can optimize your Zoom experience with us. Later on in the evening, our panelists will be taking questions from all of you. And if you'd like to participate in this live Q&A, please use the Q&A button on your Zoom screen to type your question in the window that appears. You may be more familiar with the chat function in Zoom, but for tonight, please use the Q&A function instead. We often get hundreds of questions, so I apologize if we don't get to yours while we're live. You can ask questions anytime, starting now. I also wanna let you know that we are recording this event. That recording will be made available on the hui.edu website. That's whoi.edu. We had more than 1,200 people pre-register for this event, so you're in very good company. Thank you and welcome to you all. All right, let's get started. Achieving success in ocean conservation is a complex navigation of science, policy, and the needs of local communities, but it is achievable. Tonight, we'll hear how scientists, communities, and non-governmental organizations or NGOs are joining forces to inform policy and together create workable, sustainable strategies for critical ocean ecosystems. We have three speakers with us this evening. They are Hui Coral Scientist Ann Cohen, the Executive Director of the Abil Society in Palau, Ann Singeo, and a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford Center for Ocean Solutions, Stacy Lewis. First, thank you to all three of you for joining us this evening to talk about making ocean conservation work. And let's get started with Anne Cohen. Anne grew up in coastal South Africa. After getting her PhD at the University of Cape Town, she came to Hui to do her postdoctoral research. And it was here that she became interested in corals and coral reefs. Anne has dived on reefs around the world and has witnessed their devastating decline firsthand. She is leading a global effort to identify climate resilient super reefs that can survive a warming ocean. Anne, welcome. Hi everyone, thank you Veronique for that wonderful introduction. It's really an honor for me to be speaking with you tonight to share the work that we're doing together with our partners to conserve our precious ocean ecosystems in a time of, of really unprecedented change. And tonight I'm doing so alongside two absolutely fabulous women, Anne Singio and Stacey Lewis, each scientists and conservationists in their own right, and women that I have met in my travels far afield and from whom I've learned so much. My journey starts here who hasn't been totally awestruck by the magic of coral reef ecosystems? The beauty, the sound, the colors, the fish. But these magical ecosystems are also working ecosystems and they work for us. A billion people around the world depend on coral reefs for their livelihoods, for food, for arable land, income from tourism. 60 million people rely entirely on coral reefs to put food on the table. Those fish are feeding their families. 
But the hard truth is that many coral reefs don't look like this anymore. None, even those the best protected coral reefs in the world have not escaped the devastating impacts of climate change. You see, over the last century, as the carbon dioxide concentration of the atmosphere has increased, so has the temperature of the oceans. And as the oceans warm, as you can see in the red line in this, in this graph, what's happening is we've, we're observing an increase in the frequency and intensity of ocean heat waves. These are periods of extreme heat. For our coral reefs, which evolved during a time when the oceans were cooler, this heat has been devastating. You see healthy corals, like the coral you see in the left panel, live in a symbiosis with tiny little plant cells that actually live inside the coral's own tissues. And those plant cells photosynthesize and they provide the coral with food. When the water gets too hot, the coral spits out its symbionts. And in so doing, it turns white. And that's why we call this process bleaching. And you see the coral in the middle panel has bleached. It's completely white. Within a week or so, that bleached coral, hanging on to life, starving to death, will ultimately die. And it'll become covered with turf algae and cyanobacteria and eventually be reduced to rubble on the reef. We've seen not only individual corals die from extreme heat they experience during these heat waves, but we've seen entire coral reefs succumb. On the left is a photograph from one of the most pristine, most productive, healthiest reefs in the world. This is Jarvis Island in the central tropical Pacific before the heat wave of 2015 struck the central Pacific. When we arrived on Jarvis a year later in 2016, 98% of the corals had died. And when the corals die, the fish disappear too. The data graph on the left of your screen confirms what you can see with your own eyes in the photograph. Most of the different types of reef fish shown here with the different color bars are trending to the left of the plot. That means the biomass of fish has plummeted as the reef has been reduced from a once vibrant ecosystem to a pile of rubble. Of course, this has massive implications for the millions of people who rely on reef fish to feed their families, for those who depend on healthy reefs for tourism income, and also for the millions of animals that healthy coral reefs call home. So many reefs have suffered like this, and as the ocean continues to warm, all coral reefs face a very uncertain future. And yet, within this bleak picture, there are signs of hope. Looking closely at Jarvis Island after the 2015 heat wave, what we saw were a few, a handful of corals, like this one in the middle of the picture, still green, miraculously survived. The most extreme heat event of the last century, this corals and a handful like it survived. These are the lucky ones. They're genetically different from their neighbors, even of the same species. You see what's happening 
is that nature doesn't put all her eggs in one basket. There are 850 species of coral in the world today. And within each species are individuals that are more heat tolerant than others. And if you look even closely amongst the branches of this coral, what we see are many tiny pink bundles. You can see those uh, at the white arrows in the central picture. And what those pink bundles are, are eggs. And at the full moon, this mother coral will release her eggs into the ocean where they will be carried on the ocean currents, become fertilized and develop into new baby corals, breathing life once again into this devastated reef. And what we are finding is that this incredible thermal tolerance, this resilience is not just limited to one coral. In fact, as we took our sailboat across the Pacific, what we started to see, what we started to find were entire reef communities made up of different kinds of coral species surviving extreme levels of heat. So the reef on the left, for example, saw exactly the same heat in 2015 as the, as the reef on the left, uh, on the right. But the, the reef on the left survived whereas the one on the right died. These reefs, the ones that are surviving extreme levels of heat are what we're calling the super reefs. And we know now from our genetic analyses that super reefs like this one here in Palau are able to produce heat tolerant larvae that travel on the currents dispersing many miles from home, where they are able to settle and grow, create new coral communities that maintain their heat tolerance and survive the next heat wave. Recently, my students and I, this is my student Nathan Mollica underwater at one of our super corals, we conducted a little experiment we extracted 25 samples from one super coral colony and planted them out on the reef, as you can see in, in the picture number two on the, on the right. When we came back to the site, we had 25 healthy super corals ready, ready to be outplanted on the reef. So then what we realized, what we could in essence do is accelerate nature's own strategy to seed the reefs with thermally tolerant progeny. So far, we found a handful of super reefs. And the more we learn about them, the more we realize there are other super reefs out there. This map shows all the coral reefs in the world in blue, there's a lot. And shown in the yellow stars are the super reefs that we've discovered so far. You can see we found super reefs in Thailand, in the South China Sea, in Palau, in the country of Kiribati. In fact, Kiribati is home to many super reefs in the Phoenix Islands and in the Southern Nine Islands. And as we studied the super reefs, we started to understand how they evolved. And this information we can use to alert us to where the rest of the super reefs might be. You see, many super reefs exist in areas of the reef where the water temperatures are chronically hot. And the reason for that is because if the waters are high anyway, the larvae that the coral larvae that settle there have to be able to deal with that heat. They are naturally thermally tolerant. 
But how do you find places on the reef that are chronically hot? So this is a, a, an image of Canton, a coral reef island in the Central Pacific, in the country of Kiribati. And what you're seeing on the left is the very best Google satellite image of that reef. And it's beautiful, but it doesn't look like there's a whole lot going on there. And we certainly can't see what the temperatures on the reef are doing. So then I made use of, or I exploited this amazing uh, expertise and collaborative nature of Hui scientists. I pulled in a physical oceanographer slash engineer, Gordon Zhang, to work with me to build hydrodynamic models of coral reef systems. And the image on the right, which I call the super view of the coral reef, really shows us with the arrows, all the currents that are flowing around the reef, and with the colors, how variable the water temperatures are just within a single reef system. The red colors show us where the chronically hot areas are. The blue colors are cooler. And what those chronically hot areas indicate are where we are likely to find Canton super reefs. Then comes the big test. And this actually requires us to travel to um, the islands where our models are telling us the super reefs might be, uh, bringing our experimental uh, gear with us. This is uh, uh, what we call a hot box, you can see in the left uh, photograph, uh, developed by my colleagues, Steve Palumbi, Dan Barshus, and Mike Fox, uh, to test for the heat tolerance of corals. So it's basically a cooler that we put the corals into and we can heat it up and we know exactly which temperature they'll bleach. So on the right, what you're seeing are two different coral colonies, same species, but different genotypes at 30 degrees Celsius. You see they're both brown, they both have their color, they're not bleached. But let's ramp up the temperature a bit to 34 degrees Celsius. And you see the coral on the left turns white immediately, whereas the coral on the right sticks it out. That coral can survive temperatures of 34 degrees Celsius. So here we are. Nature has revealed to us that she hedges her bets. And science has shown us that we can find where these super reefs are and we can confirm their existence with our assays. We've discovered communities of corals that can survive extreme heat across the Pacific Basin. And with genetics tracing, we know that the larvae produced on these reefs are carried on the ocean currents and can reseed neighboring areas that have been devastated by climate change. And we know that protecting these super reefs from local stresses is critical for the future survival of coral reefs on planet Earth. But just because we know these things doesn't make it happen in the real world. In fact, at the time we started this project, few super reefs were protected. What this means is that the coral reefs that can survive climate change, that can survive the changes that we're gonna see over the next few decades, are vulnerable to the local stresses that you'll hear about from Stacy and Anne later in this presentation. These are the stresses like dynamiting, overfishing, erosion, runoff from land. And it's not because coral reef countries aren't protecting their reefs, they are. In fact, Palau, you can see at the left, is a world leader in marine protected areas. It was just that when we started discovering Palau super reefs, those reefs shown in the yellow were not protected at the time. And at right is a satellite image of an atoll called Funafuti, home to 10,000 people. 
Funafuti has a huge marine protected area on its west side. It's an incredible accomplishment. But the corals that dodged the heat wave in 2015 are actually lo located in the north of the atoll, in that yellow area. And they are currently unprotected from the local stresses like jet dredging. So this is where I realized that the science that I was doing could really make a huge difference to the future of coral reefs on this planet. But publishing in the best scientific journals just wasn't enough. Conservation decisions are being made every day based on the best available science. But the scientific process is actually quite slow. Getting papers to press can often take a year or more. So I started to seek opportunities to connect. And to be honest, I was stepping way out of my comfort zone. And I made a lot of mistakes along the way. But I also learned a lot. And I met wonderful people, very receptive people. I connected with people in super reef countries, with scientists, with government ministers, with conservation organizations. I used every opportunity I could get to get attention on super reefs. Actually, one day I was sitting at my computer and I got an email from the producers at Nova. Uh, and they asked me to review the script for a movie that they were producing on coral reefs. And they were uh, talking about how climate change was devastating coral reefs around the world and how this was uh, an enormous problem, which of course it is. But they had completely left out the super reefs. And I said to them, you know, you really can't make this movie without talking about Palau. Palau has coral reefs that are going to survive climate change, that are surviving climate change. And it was through this, these efforts, connecting with the people and the scientists of Palau, like I, I did in, in, in this photograph, that in fact, Palau's super reefs now have elevated protection status. In fact, the last time we visited Palau, Palau it was very difficult to get into our super reef sites because now they have such um, better protections. And those efforts uh, and the incredible people that I met along the way connected me with others. And in 2018, I was invited to present Super Reefs to the Polynesian Leaders Group in Tuvalu. I was actually pretty terrified because, I mean, this was like high levels of government. These were presidents and prime ministers of nine Polynesian nations. But here too, Super Reefs was well received. And at the end of the summit, in the Amatuku Declaration on Climate Change and Oceans, nine Polynesian na uh, nations committed to find, manage, and conserve their super reefs across Polynesia. For many island nations, for many coral reef nations, protections can mean tremendous sacrifice. And we must see these efforts and acknowledge these efforts to protect coral reefs as a gift to all of us, as a gift to humanity, to future generations. I was honored in 2019 to be invited by Ambassador Sito of Kiribati to address the United Nations on Kiribati's super reefs. Kiribati is extraordinarily proud of their super reefs, and they should be. They're located in one of the largest marine protected areas in the world, the Phoenix Islands Marine Protected Area, a gift to humanity by the country of Kiribati. Just recently, everything started percolating together. All the science, the people that I'd met, the stakeholders, 
the non-governmental organizations that I've been working with, the conservation organizations, especially the Nature Conservancy, who've really held my hand through this process. We took great ideas to our philanthropic partners using the science and the technology we developed. And we are currently working on establishing the first super reef marine protected area in the Marshall Islands, in the Republic of the Marshall Islands, together with the people of the Marshall Islands and the Marshall Islands Conservation Society. You know, it's really interesting because th the timing was everything. COVID happened, we were stuck here in Woods Hall with our super reef being developed, a super reef marine protector being developed thousands of miles away in the Marshall Islands. We couldn't get there, but it all, it's all happening because of Zoom. The same way that I'm speaking with you tonight, we've been able to connect with our partners in the Marshall Islands, We've deployed our instruments, we're building our models, we're moving forward and really looking forward to the time when we can actually travel there. Thank you so much for your attention this evening. It's been so wonderful to, to share the story with you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Anne. Um, I <clears throat> love that image of the corals sending their eggs out on the currents when the moon is full, that's terrific. Um, now let's hear from our next presenter, Stacy Lewis. Stacy is an ocean conservation scientist with over two decades of multidisciplinary experience studying coral reef ecology, ocean governance, and the human dimensions of ocean sustainability. She has experience as a policymaker in Washington, D.C., and as a researcher in Palau, an archipelago of more than 500 islands in the Western Pacific Ocean where she has studied the relationships between local residents, coastal ecosystems, fisheries, and policy. Stacy is currently with Stanford Center for Ocean Solutions, continuing her work in Palau. Welcome, Stacy. Thanks, Veronique, and hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. I am absolutely honored to be here on this virtual stage with Ann Cohen and Ann Senio. Tonight, I'm gonna to talk about creating pathways for solutions. And the message I want to get across to you tonight is that different conservation problems have similar pathways for solutions. And I'm going to highlight four important pathways. And my story takes place in the Republic of Palau. As Veronique said, it's an archipelago in the Western Pacific made up of hundreds of islands, 12 of which are inhabited by Palau's 18,000 residents over the landmass the size of San Jose, California. Now, while Palau, as you can see in these next images, is an ocean, a big ocean, small island nation, it, it has a global reputation for its successful strategies in tackling some of the biggest ocean conservation problems, whether it's their aggressive response to illegal fishing or their bold action in 2020 to close 80% of its waters to foreign fishing. But Palau has been successful in other ocean conservation problems like this one. Sediment runoff. Sediment coming out into the coastal zones, smothering corals and degrading these vital ecosystems for the Palauan people. Just like other conservation problems, in order to find solutions, we have to understand the drivers of those problems. And for sediment runoff, those drivers can be told by two storytellers. The first storyteller is coral reefs that can trace the environmental change and the history. Next slide, please. The second storyteller is the farmers and the fishers who've witnessed those environmental changes. But you may ask yourself, how can corals tell us the story of environmental change? And that has everything to do with how corals grow. And in this next slide, you'll see that as corals grow, 
they draw down calcium from the water column to build their calcium carbonate skeleton. But when sediment, particularly land-based sediment, is in the water at the time of growth, that sediment brings trace metals into the water that's similar in structure to calcium. And so corals will draw down those trace metals and have an environmental timestamp in their skeleton. And for those of us who are interested in measuring sediment history using these trace metals, we can design experiments and sampling strategies in different watersheds. And on the next slide, you'll see my approach to sampling corals in two different watersheds, the near Madhu watershed and near Akil, sampling corals near river mouths to the open ocean. And in the next slide, you'll see me sampling some of those corals. And then we can use isotopes to establish a chronology or date them. And then we can measure these trace metals in the coral skeletons and compare that with the dating. In the next slide, you'll see some of my results from Irai Bay, the barium to calcium ratios in the top uh, graph, manganese to calcium ratios in the bottom. The higher the peak, the more sediment at the time of growth. Now using historic records, I connected some of these peaks to land use change, like airport expansions and road construction, as well as some weather events. But it's important to remember that science is just one cog in the solution wheel. And in order to validate our work, but also to make sure our science gets taken up into policy considerations, we need to talk to our second storyteller. And that's people like Oolong. But how do we find these storytellers? And this leads me to the first pathway. Develop on location partnerships. That's reaching out to different organizations, community groups, so that we can identify those storytellers. And that's what I was able to do. And I spent time with Oolong uh, on, on those mats in the tarot patches, learning from them uh, how to, to, to farm those tarot patches, learned about the changes that they've seen, spent time with reef fishers, spent time in those rivers to really understand the system, but to also understand their stories of environmental change. This leads me to my second pathway support embedded research. Anthropologists and scientists from humanities embrace embedded research as a way to contextualize their subjects. And I implore natural scientists to consider embedded research in their approach, whether that's supporting grad students to have extended time in the field or establishing long-term collaborations with the places of interest in those groups. But it's through that embedded research that we can really get that thick understanding of what's going on in the field. Through my embedded research, it started to become clear the way that Palau was able to tackle the conservation problem of sediment runoff was through the story of Palau's Watershed Alliance. It all started with the construction of the compact road or the ring road around Babel Dab, which took about nine years to construct and during this time, large areas of land were cleared, leading to large amounts of sediments, sediment going into Palau's rivers, clogging up the riverways, and smothering their corals. These visible signs of change mobilized people to come together and ask questions about how do we, how do we address this problem? What are the solutions? This mobilization of different actors really motivated me to ask questions about how social networks influence conservation solutions. And when I talk about social networks, I mean people and how they're connected to each other. This is an emerging part of science and theory tells us that more connections in a network are conducive to things like legislative action that requires compromise and consensus you need to have people who know each other and have higher degrees of trust for that type of decision. Less connected networks are conducive to things like learning. You have diverse stakeholders in a network. They might not know each other, but they might have different ways of knowing and coming together, they can learn from each other. And what I wanted to do is apply these theories and see how, it, how the Watershed Alliance 
actually aligned with these theories. And that leads me to my third pathway, find the messenger. And that's exactly what the Watershed Alliance did. They found the, the BWA, the Balao Watershed Alliance founding members realized they needed to find messengers that could build trust and catalyze conservation action. And for Palau, those key messengers were the customary leaders, still revered by communities for their authority on environmental stewardship. These messengers are highly connected and therefore have influence. And what they were able to do was to build communities trust on what the Watershed Alliance was trying to do, but also get legislators and state policymakers motivated to create past laws to create protected areas on land and in the water to combat the sediment runoff. But passing these laws and creating those protected areas, that's just the first step. Now the real work begins. And that's my fourth pathway. Identify stakeholders, know them, involve them. And that was the next step for the Watershed Alliance. They engaged stakeholders to propel learning and compliance. They brought participants from different corners of the communities to learn from each other and relay new knowledge to subgroups. Through these efforts, awareness, there was an increase in general awareness, not only of the problem of sediment runoff, but the fact that individuals can change their behavior and their, that different outcomes could, be, could, could come out of just changing your behavior, complying, participating, cooperating in these protected areas, being part of the management planning process. These outreach and education events continue today. And in the next slide, you'll see pictures of a more recent demonstration. And this is our, our next speaker, Ensigno, having one of these demonstrations of how water retention is different when you have grass versus different types of soil. And so go back to my message from the beginning. Different conservation problems have similar pathways for solutions. So when we're talking about coral reef conservation and protected areas, we think about those pathways for solutions. It's developing those on, those on location partnerships. It's supporting embedded research so we can connect what we're finding when we're finding these super reefs, connecting it with the people who depend on those super reefs, finding those messengers to carry it, not only to the policymakers, but to the stakeholders and the other resource users and involving those stakeholders who have so much to lose from these, from not acting from, and they have so much to gain from these solutions. I can't think of a better messenger or researcher to talk more about these types of pathways than our next speaker, Ansingio. Thanks so much. Thank you, Stacy. Um, before we go to Anne, uh, we do have a, an audience poll that we want to do. Um, and you should be seeing that pop up on your screen if you're joining us on Zoom tonight. Um, our question for you is how much of the global ocean is protected? How much of the global ocean is protected? Lots of people participating, that's great. All right, our poll is now closed. And um, as most of you uh, figured out, the answer is 7.5%. So not very much of the ocean is pr protected and the percentage of the ocean uh, with protections that limit extractive activities like fishing and mining is even lower, it's somewhere around 5%. All right. Now I'd like to introduce our third speaker, Anne Singale. Anne is actually joining us from Palau right now, where I think it's a little after 10 in the morning tomorrow. So we're spanning both time and space to bring you this event tonight. Um, in Palau, Anne works with communities to develop programs to support livelihoods and to sustain natural resources. 
Anne is the executive director of the Abiel Society, a nonprofit organization that provides environmental education based both on traditional knowledge and science, and which also advocates for community-based governance for effective conservation and resource management. Anne, welcome. Thank you, Veronique, and good morning, everybody from Palau. Um, uh, in Palau, um, and particularly at Abiel Society, we um, uh, work uh, very closely with resource users on the land, farmers, uh, uh, builders, and uh, fishers. And uh, in, in my presentation, I'm going to uh, use a current project that we're doing in Palau to demonstrate the importance of knowing who your stakeholders are and engaging them uh, right from the beginning in order to um, develop a successful uh, implementation of conservation, conservation projects. So, so Palau small scale fishers uh, um, actually traditionally has, and, and, and it involves men and women. Uh, women are the fishers of the, the shallow coastal areas from mangroves to the nearest coral um, reef uh, slope. And men uh, tend to fish in the deep water but beyond the, uh, the lagoon and, uh, and also into the deep sea. But uh, uh, more recently, with all different types of science and development on uh, fisheries uh, programs and management, the, the tendency is to always assume that the uh, men are the, the users of the ocean and uh, would have a tendency to engage with men and uh, exclude women in the conversations. And as a result, the, the fisheries where women are the, the participants or dominant um, users, the habitats have been lost to degradation or permanent chains from unsustainable development, including overfishing. Um, uh, uh, of the particular species in those habitat. In this graph, uh, it shows the, how men and women are, are um, both engaged in uh, fisheries. And on the left side, it shows gear types where men tend to dominate um, uh, spear fishing, trolling, casting, net fishing, but men and women are about equally um, uh, distributed in the use of bottom line fishing. Um, but when it comes to harvesting, gleaning and harvesting, you can see that uh, women are more uh, dominant uh, uh, fishers in uh, collecting crab, um, uh, clams uh, uh, of different types and, as, uh, and so much more in terms of sea cucumber species. Um, Women are uh, represent 73% of our subsistence market activities, which is a very important statement to make, because not only are they the, the vast users of the nearby um, marine areas, but they are also um, the dominant market traders of seafood in our, um, in our uh, small village market. And uh, women fishers uh, are not just dominating the market, but they are also, they count on the sales of their fisheries uh, to support their livelihood and as their uh, primary source of income. Compared to men who most of them are, are fishing and selling to supplement a, uh, a job that they already have. So not including women in conversations of management or even development programs for improving fisheries management um, can really result in devastating loss of uh, marine habitats, as well as impacting and displacing families and lives that rely on those resources for their livelihood. And so this, uh, from this uh, research where we um, had, an, uh, had an opportunity to talk with various fishers across Palau wide and um, visiting habitats with these women, including visiting um, uh, interviews with um, local scientists and um, abroad, scientists abroad. 
it became clear that um, the, 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 not only are we, should we begin to look at the, uh, managing better those uh, resources that women rely on, but uh, it is uh, almost at a point of, uh, at this point of depletion, it's, it's, we're at a point of uh, almost a serial depletion where if we don't take uh, quick and uh, robust actions to restore our marine habitats, there is a chance that we could lose them forever. And so with this, uh, the results of this research and the information gotten from the fishermen, we have began to increase conversations uh, of fisheries management that engages with both community members, men and women community members, understanding that because of their different use of the ocean, they have also different knowledge of the ocean that are so important um, of to be included in the decision making because the change in our ocean um, is uh, part of the human activities that have uh, either permanently changed or greatly devastated those uh, fishing grounds. And so without including the, the, the comprehensive men and women um, resource users in this dialogue, you can, uh, you may design um, a management plans uh, that may not be as effective. And um, so with this, our, our current project now is uh, uh, combining science and fisheries, uh, women fishers uh, knowledge of uh, lunar cycles and spawning tendencies of the species that they target to improve our um, hatchery spawning activities that will uh, focus on restoring uh, sea cucumbers into this devastated fishing grounds um, so that women can uh, once again uh, uh, be able to rely on the same resources that they have for thousands of years and continue to rely on those resources to support their families. And so taking a science, science approach and uh, uh, developing a solution that is conservation uh, focused that eventually will improve the social benefits uh, deriving from improved uh, seagrass and uh, um, other marine habitats. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, and thank you to Stacy and other Anne as well. Um, before we open things up for audience questions, and we've been getting a lot of questions behind the scenes here, uh, we have one more perspective that we'd like to bring in to the discussion. Peter Thompson is the United Nations Secretary General Special Envoy for the Ocean. And as you'll hear, Peter is from Fiji, a nation of about 300 islands in the South Pacific Ocean and home to numerous coral reefs. Peter was unable to join us in person tonight, but he wanted to share this video message with you. Ladies and gentlemen, greetings to one and all, wherever you are today. And I hope that you and your loved ones are healthy and happy. And many thanks to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution for the opportunity of addressing you all. As you may know, I come from Fiji and as such, my earliest memories revolve around the ocean alongside it and on it and in it. And when I think of those times today, I remember the hardships of storms at sea, of seasickness in an incessant ocean swells, of being caught in currents and undertoes when swimming, or being stung by jellyfish and cut by coral. But then I remember the eternal beauty of seascapes, and the wonder of arrival at islands by sea, and the great joy of diving in coral canyons teeming with life or paddling homemade tin boats through the mangroves and out into the lagoon, <clears throat> feasting on succulent seafood and breathing in the cleanest of air possible, propelled by southeast trade winds across thousands of open miles of the South Pacific Ocean. You know, it wasn't until well into my life that I heard the expression coral bleaching and witnessed its decimation when diving. The only desolation I can compare that to is the pictures I've seen of cities turned to lifeless rubble by incendiary bombs. As a youth, the only flotsam and jetsam to be found on our beaches were organic, 
shells, timber, seaweed, and if you were lucky, a nautilus shell or the occasional glass fishing float netted in ragged rope. Of course, those were the days before plastic, and I can clearly recall plastic's entry on the scene and its increasing evidence along the tide lines. What a plague upon nature plastic has proved to be. These days, when I think of the ocean, I think of the respect it deserves as the governor of our planet and the ultimate source of life. Ladies and gentlemen, in my role as the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for the Ocean, I'm charged with leading the global drive for the implementation of the UN's 14th Sustainable Development Goal, known to most as SDG 14, or the Ocean's Goal. SDG 14 sets out to conserve and sustainably use the ocean's resources, and I'm sure you're all familiar with its 10 specific targets. In the course of this work, it's become increasingly obvious that ocean science must be the foundation upon which the achievement of SDG 14 is built. It's estimated that science knows only 10% of the ocean's makeup, its biome, its seafloor, its deep sea creatures, its microorganisms and uh, phytoplankton uh, types. This is an astounding situation when you consider that the ocean contains the majority of life on this planet and that it covers 70% of the planet's surface, providing somewhere between 50 and 80% of the planet's oxygen. We have some very important decisions to make in the short to medium term about humankind's relationship with nature. And if these decisions are to be fully informed before they're made, they'll have to be based on good science. One of the key lessons of the COVID pandemic has been that our governance policies must be firmly rooted in reliable science. These considerations led to the member states of the United Nations embedding science into the theme of the next UN Ocean Conference to be held in support of SDG 14's implementation. It also led them to mandate the UN Decade of Ocean Science, known as the Ocean Decade, running from 2020 to 2030. This is the decade in which, the, in which ocean science will catch up on the 90% of the oceans unknown. In short, the Ocean Decade will give us the science we need for the ocean we want. To enable the Ocean Decade to deliver on its high purpose, Inclusivity and partnership are being built into its DNA, and communities around the world are being connected. Communities come in many forms, nations big and small, regional groupings, academia, business consortiums, indigenous peoples, coastal dwellers, NGOs, the list goes on. All have a place in our discovery of the complete scientific picture of the ocean, for we are all connected. In conclusion, allow me to tell you that I have a mantra that runs, science leads to planning, leads to finance. To explain, in order to carry out the SDG 14 work that coastal communities require for their future security, like developing resilient coastal infrastructure or maintaining marine protected areas or installing offshore wind farms or investing in sustainable aquaculture, finance is required. But before providers of finance part with their funds, just as is the case on land, they want to see evidence of sound planning. For marine plans to be bankable, sustainable and credible, they must be based on peer-reviewed ocean science. Thus, science leads to planning, leads to finance. I wish you stimulating discussions during the course of today's event, and I thank you for your attention. And that was Peter Thompson, the United Nations Secretary General Special Envoy for the Ocean. Thank you, Peter, for sharing your thoughts with us and for wearing your hooey hat. Uh, that's great. All right, we are now at the time for your questions, audience. And please remember that you can submit them using the Q&A function in Zoom. I'm going to lead things off uh, just briefly with a question for all the panelists. Um, in his video message, and I think we have a slide showing this, Peter referred to the 10 goals or targets of the United Nations 14th Sustainable Development Goal. And there they are. Um, in looking at these targets, uh, very many of them seem relevant to the issues that you all have been talking about tonight. And I highlighted the ones that I thought seemed the most relevant in white, but you may disagree. Um, 
how are we doing so far at meeting those uh, goals globally and, and then specifically in Palau and maybe Anne Singeo, we could start uh, with you. Thank you, Veronique. Um, yeah, I, um, I think that the, I think we've uh, done a lot of this uh, or even beyond. I know for sure that the, the Micronesia challenge uh, was uh, um, sort of key um, political strategy that uh, um, proposed to uh, conserve at least 30% of our coastal waters in Palau. And uh, we have surpassed that um, about 10 years ago. Um, and then uh, furthermore, um, we've enclosed 80% of our EEZ. So altogether, Palau has accomplished over um, uh, their 30% goal of coastal marine areas protection. And, um, and uh, a lot of those um, actions taken uh, by Palau in conservation has also led to uh, enormous uh, level of support, both financial and technical uh, towards the uh, marine um, uh, resource management of Palau. So, and also um, has uh, created a lot of uh, strong partnerships uh, for us uh, in the down in the, at the community level. Uh, for instance, the work that we do uh, benefits greatly from uh, the, the science uh, um, side of uh, information where we can bounce back ideas between the indigenous uh, knowledge of the ocean and the current science with Stanford. Um, we have been able to really strengthen our approach in uh, resource management, but even furthermore, uh, from moving from concept to, to actual application uh, of restoration work with community members who rely on those resources for their lives. All right, thank you. Uh, Stacy. do you wanna add anything? I'll just say, you know, Palau is, is we should be learning from Palau, uh, from their progress, as, as Anne said, their bold action to close 80% of their waters to foreign fishing to really bolster their small scale fisheries. Um, you know, we're learning a lot of lessons as they, they make these really uh, progressive actions about how hard it is to make these decisions um, and the consequences and, and as a big ocean nation, uh, there's a lot of geopolitical forces that would not want to have, would want to keep fishing in their in their waters, uh, but they continue to kind of be that beacon of of hope for for all of us. And I would say that the other thing just to mention is that one of the SDGs about protecting 10% of the coastal and marine areas. You know, it's not just as as Ann Cohen was saying, it's not just protecting. It's it's finding the places that need to be protected. Um, it, you simply just finding a place on the map and protecting that area is, isn't simply enough. So, so this, this move towards large scale marine protected areas isn't a panacea. It's not the whole answer, but it's, it's the step in the right direction. So, you know, there's that challenge that we have at finding the right places to protect, not only to meet that SDG goal of 10%, but to find the right places that have that resilience and, and have evolved to be able to meet the challenges in the global and local stressors of tomorrow. Well, it's interesting. You said we should all be learning from Palau. And actually one of our questions from Terry uh, is asking about why we don't see the same level of communication and engagement in the US that you know, we're seeing in Palau. What are, what are the barriers here in the US uh, to effective conservation? I don't know if you wanna take that one, Anne Cohen. You're on mute, Anne. There we go. I've wondered that a lot myself. Um, and I might not be the right person to answer that specific question about Palau. But from an outsider, what I see when looking, in, uh, looking at Palau is tremendous leadership, visionary leadership uh, in the high levels of government. I see people um, who, who work together, who know each other, who are working towards a common goal, 
who who recognize um, the dependence of their society on the ocean and on the reefs. Um, this is this is a, an, a you know an ancient culture uh, that has been around for thousands of years, uh, relying on the reef, relying on the oceans, uh, have tremendous respect um, for the ocean. And the, the people of Palau, in my experience, just have a different relationship with the, with the environment from what you see um, in an enormous place like the US. And I'm not, you know, it's not blaming anyone, um, but there's definitely a connect, connection with the environment that you don't see here. That coupled with visionary leadership um, I think makes it work. But that's from an outside perspective. <laughs> I think, Veronica, I'd like to say a little bit about that. Um, I think that the difference is we, we live with the ocean. You know, we don't just live off of the ocean. We live with the ocean. The, the interconnection between a Palauan person and an ocean is, is uh, interesting. Like, uh, I give you a great example. I, I can sit in my office and I can feel the wind and I know that the tide is coming. But um, a fisherman, a mature fisherman in my community, if he were sitting over here and if I were to say, I feel tide is coming in, he would be a lot, his thoughts are much further than that. His thoughts would be, the wind at this hour and the tide coming in means this species of fish is spawning in this part of the reef. So you see, not only do we understand the reef like, like it's part of our anatomy, it is also we are the first to feel its pain when something goes wrong because that's how close we live with the ocean. And I think it's inevitable when you live in a society like this to want to be part of that solution, to want to know what is happening. And I think if we are not doing the work, as Stacey is recommending embedded research where we are identifying people on the ground, doing the work, working with them, then you're missing a huge opportunity to have people solve their own problems. Yeah. I want to stay with Palau for, for a little bit more um, and with you and uh, we have a question from Susie who says will establishing marine protected areas in super reef uh, regions and maybe this is also for Ann Cohen um, how will that affect fishing for example of local villagers and actually this could be a question for any of you um, but uh, let's start with in Palau, have you seen an impact on, on fishing and, and how have uh, fishers dealt with the fact that so much area is now protected? I think it, it, it does. It does, um, um, and at different stages of development, it affects them differently. And I think that one of the misconception, like I said, like what Stacy is recommending as part of our research, embedded research, understanding who are the users, engaging them right from the beginning, um, um, the, the marine protected areas in Palau in the past uh, um, uh, were not necessarily um, initiated uh, using that same approach that Stacy was suggesting. But I remember a time where um, a fisherman said to me, I, I saw a lot of uh, different people coming into the village and I said, what's happening? And he said, I don't know. And I said, uh, don't you want to find out? And he says, well, I know why they're here. They're here because they're going to hold a meeting to tell us about our reef. And I said, well, don't you want to go and find out what they're saying? And he said, they came and they asked us and we tell them and now they're coming back and they, they put it in computers and they try to tell us what we already know. You know, it's not so much, uh, you know, what was being said. For me, uh, I immediately thought to myself, I hope we're not working in the same manner where we feel 
um, where we are looked at as uh, intruders rather than people who have shared the same interest as they do in protecting their ocean. So that led us to start a research project with children in the community where they were monitoring fish, fish landings from the same fishermen. And from that, the fishermen decided to initiate their own um, uh, fishery research. Um, and so they designed their own monitoring uh, program and we implemented it for three years, which was later on a year, just a year after it was named as the only legitimate scientific study on fisheries in the region. Um, a lot of them were, a lot of um, scientists were doubted that it had any merits. Uh, the first question they asked was, which scientists designed it? And I said, the fishermen. Um, but the, after that, that's how it attracted a lot of research and science to come into this village. And today, um, and also what, what that attested to was the fishermen found out for themselves that they spent majority of their time fishing around the MPA, the Marine Protected Preserve area. And they themselves, um, it was sort of a testimony for them to say, it does work. Marine protected areas that work if we do it the right way. So today they're most proud of that, the marine protected area. And because of that, it promotes them wanting to be part of a dialogue towards better managing resource. So I think the science uh, that says we need to do this and this is excellent. It provides well thought out, scientifically proven approach. But when you don't have the human component in there, is when it can be undermined by the actions of those who use the resource. So in order for us to be really true about those effort and having people who respect and are protecting those uh, preserves, they must be engaged right from the beginning so you, we don't feel the need to explain ourselves as we are in the middle of all the things that we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Cohen, we're getting a lot of questions about super reefs, um, and I want to make sure we get to some of them. So uh, I'm going to kind of combine a couple here from Cassie and Christina. So Cassie asks, are super reefs made up of different species or just individuals or colonies that happen to be adapted to high temperatures and sort of related to that from Christina, do the heat tolerant corals have a known genetic marker or a gene that's making them heat tolerant? Oh, those are such good questions. Um, uh, they're slightly different, so I'll just answer the first one first. Um, so the, there are about 850 uh, known species of hard corals, skeletonian corals, in the oceans today. And all of those species have populations that are more heat tolerant than others of the same species. Uh, what nature does is uh, doesn't make everybody the same. Just like some humans um, are more sensitive to getting colds and flu, um, some humans are not. Uh, well, corals are the same way. And um, they just happen to be, uh, because, you know, it's not just happen to be. Uh, I mean, it, this is like, this is very clever on nature's part because coral reefs are so heterogeneous in terms of their temperature regimes, um, coral populations have to be naturally quite adaptable. Um, so, so we'll find in every single species of coral uh, that exists on, in the oceans today, some populations that are, that are thermally tolerant, individuals, groups of individuals that are thermally tolerant. The problem is that the temperatures are so high now and the heat waves are so strong, the thermal tolerance of many individuals in the population has been surpassed. So there's really very few, uh, there's not a lot of corals that, are, that, can, that can deal with the heat, like especially that we saw in 2015. Palau didn't get that heat wave. Um, but hundreds of coral reefs across the world did. So what we're gonna have to do, um, and this goes back to the first point that was discussed, that the, the SGD 14, 
what we're going to have to do are interventions. Uh, one intervention is the most obvious is to protect those corals that can survive this onslaught of heat waves, protect them from the local stresses that Anne and Stacey have been talking about. The other is that we are going to have to plant out corals and restore coral reefs. We're just going to have to do that. Just think about it. Florida right now has about 5% of its original live coral cover. That's a decline of about 90% of corals in Florida. Puerto Rico, same thing. 5% live coral cover. These places have been decimated. And even if we protect the last few remaining corals, those reefs aren't gonna just come back without some pretty heavy intervention. Um, and that's gonna include managing the local stresses that Stacy and Anne have been talking about. And this cannot be done without the involvement of local communities. I've sort of gone off the original questions a little bit, I'm sorry. That's um, okay. Um, but I, I want, can, can I make a point is there a gene about the Palau, that, uh, Palau question that Anne uh, and Sinjio responded to about the marine protected areas and how they affect the fishers? Certainly. Um, and I think this is, this is really a, a, a sort of question that, that, that Stacy and Anne can probably both contribute to. Uh, when, when an area is de declared protected, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's closed off to subsistence fishing or to local fishermen, right? There's a difference between a no-take and a protected area. But I think you know more about these than I do. Um, and maybe you, can, you, you both of you can speak to that. There are different levels of protection. Yeah, and some protections are just temporary, like the traditional bull, and right? That was that was um, designated by the chiefs, and that was temporary for when they saw declines. Um, but to the point about designating protected areas, you know, you have to get those stakeholders in at the very beginning to help show them the trade-offs for you to understand their trade-offs and what they're thinking in their brain about their losses. And then there's that's where that consensus and that compromise comes in is, is you know, that they will have that buy-in necessary. But to, to I'll leave it to Ansonio to talk a little bit more about the protection in Palau, but there's temporal and there's spatial, and it's not always one and the same. Right, and I think we also understand that we need to do a multitude of different approach, that the one approach uh, is not going to help uh, to restore the, the health of our ocean. And we are now understanding that in, included with those protected areas, the, the no entry zones, um, uh, we also need to manage the activities in the open space. So yes, um, I think the whole uh, reef of the community where I am at in Mira Elong is, is considered a marine protected area because it has different uh, levels of management, uh, but across all of its oceans. So, yeah. I want to uh, give a uh, question to Stacy. This is from Lisa, um, and she was asking specifically about hui scientists, but I think it could be generalized to any scientist. How do scientists get their knowledge to decision makers? How, how do we get, how do we make that translation from, you know, the scientist in the lab or in the field, finding things out and getting that in front of the policymakers who need to know about it? I mean, it really, you know, going back to my points about pathways, it's really about those partnerships. Um, and, and to what end are you, are you thinking? To what decision maker? You're, you're talking about insight to impact. Um, and if you're talking about uh, communities that you don't live in, then you have to start supporting embedded research and supporting those on location partnerships. Um, but if you're talking about, you know, basic research where you really need NIH or NSF funding, there's, you know, there's pathways to get engaged working with your local members of Congress. 
Um, there's, there's so many different ways that you can engage, but it's always first asking the question to what end? Um, and what is the end, what's the impact of your, your study? Um, and, you know, luckily in the US, we have a lot of different ways in our democratic government to be engaged. But I think when you're working in different countries, it's really, you, it takes a lot of time. And I think that's, that's where a lot of natural scientists, uh, the hurdles and the barriers to having embedded research is the time that it takes um, to, to be engaged. So I think there's a lot of questions to ask yourself before engaging with decision makers, but I guarantee that there's a way to communicate how important your science is to decision makers. It's just yeah. figuring that out. Yeah, I'm sure the answer is a little different in every question. And just to sort of address Lisa's question about HUI, you know, we our scientists do that in a lot of different ways. Um, they write op-eds. Sometimes we use the media, the you know, the media coverage to get our uh, research out there in front of the public and in front of policymakers. Um, but sometimes our, our scientists give, you know, Senate testimony uh, to committees. I know, Anne, I think you've done that actually. Yeah, um, so, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's all different ways that that can happen. Um, let's see here. All right, this is just kind of a, a fun question uh, about those sea cucumbers and uh, what are sea cucumbers used for? And I uh, believe they're eaten is, is the answer to that. But so how do you eat a sea cucumber? Different ways of preparation and processing for a different species. But the, um, the most likely one is the, you eat them just like uh, raw, it's like sashimi, yeah. But in the Asian countries, they actually cook it. So I mean, some of the the the, the sea cucumbers that are most devastated in our countries uh, have been decimated to almost nothingness. Are the ones that are targeted for food in the Asian country. So the trade of sea cucumber has gone on for forever. Um, started in the early late 1800s, 1900s in Palau. And so those targeted species are the ones that we are um, spawning right now in tanks and, and um, putting it back into the ocean to try and restore those ocean where, where they live. But I think um, even uh, just aside from it being eaten, I think that it has played such a tremendous role in our ecosystem that if it were to be wiped out, uh, it completely throws our ecosystem into off balance. But I think also what's important is that the way we think here in Palau is that when you say in a, in a marine ecosystem or ocean ecosystem, we're really including us humans in that ecosystem. And so when it goes out of balance, that puts us off balance as well, because it's the cyclical um, giver and taking and and it has to go both ways. And I think that's uh, probably what's more important to the women fishers who we're working with today. When we first began these projects, the scientists we're working with said, well, we know how to spawn things in tanks, but we don't know what are the spawning cycles of the sea cucumber you're talking about. And the women said, well, we know. We harvest the sea cucumber so we know when the spawning times are. And so in one trial, we spawned millions and millions of eggs wow. from, yeah. And that is the beauty. I mean, it gives you a lot of shortcuts uh, when you have the, the, the marry those two types of knowledge together. Yeah. You know, I have a story like that too. So when, when we first discovered the Palau super reefs, I sort of went around, <laughs> sort of boasting that we found these most incredible um, heat tolerant coral and ASAP who runs the, the aquarium at the Palau International Coral Reef Center said, oh, I've known that for years. <laughs> he says, we put those corals in our aquaria here at the aquarium and they never die. Those are the ones that never die. That was amazing. It was like we've done all the science, and here ASAP knew this all along. <laughs> yeah. Yep. 
All right, I'm being told we have time for one last question. We've already uh, gone longer than we intended here this evening, but um, how can people help coral reefs, or and I might expand that to, to coastal ecosystems in general, if they live far away from the coast, um, you know? And maybe uh, that's a question for anybody who wants it. There are so many ways. Um to help, I think what you do in your own life in terms of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, plastic usage, you know, just reducing your own footprint. Then there's also ways to contribute to the science, to the conservation organizations um, who are going out there and actually are able to, to, to get those protections put in place. Um, and then there's your vote. Your vote makes such a huge difference, especially in the US. Uh, you, you've just seen that with the transition of, of government. Um, protections that were, that were completely eradica eradicated um, by the previous administration have not instantly been uh, restored. So they are, they are multiple ways. Bring it on. Stacey, did you wanna add something? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, people say, well, I don't live near coral reefs, or I don't live near the coast, but what you do on land affects what happens in the coast and on in the water, no matter how far you live inland. And those small actions like Anne's talking about what you, you know, the, the products you buy, the waste you, you produce, the decisions you make as a consumer has a lot of power when it comes to environmental conservation. And you know, the, the terrestrial systems and the aquatic systems are connected and we're connected to them. So even though you can't go out and, and, and study a reef, you can be better connected and support good governance, but good resource management in the places where you live. And that eventually does work towards a more cohesive planet. All I right. think I agree, they've said it all, you know, choosing which companies to support, which product to buy, also has a lot of impact uh, on what happens to our oceans across the planet. So I think you have solutions in your hand right at the moment, but if, if, you, if you don't know what a coral reef looks like, um, go to Hui, go to the aquarium. But the, I have scientists who are working with me right now in Palau who grew up in places where they, they didn't have those uh, accessible to them. And, I, and he's been here forever. And I said, why, why do you keep staying here? Why don't you go home? You're young. And, and he says, everything I learned about the ocean, I can see when I put my head in the water in Palau. And that's what makes it exciting. So yeah, I think there are ways to get connected, but if you're looking for uh, empowering ways to contribute, choosing which companies to support makes a difference. Thank you. All right, I'm afraid we're gonna have to leave it there. I wanna say a big, big thank you to Anne Singea, Stacy Lewis and Anne Cohen for participating in tonight's event. It's really been a remarkable and inspiring evening. Thank you also to all of my Hui colleagues who've been working hard behind the scenes to make this event possible. And to all of you who joined us, thank you. Tonight's event was the first in our third season of Hui's Ocean Encounters virtual events. Our next Ocean Encounter will be in two weeks. So that's in two weeks on Wednesday, February 10th at 7.30 Eastern time. We'll have a conversation on the theme of saving the North Atlantic right whale, exploring partnerships and solutions for survival. Joining us for that event will be Hui whale trauma specialist, Michael Moore, commercial fisherman Rob Martin, and NOAA Fisheries Eco Ecological Economist, excuse me, Mike Azaro. We hope you'll join us for that. To register or to find out more information about our Ocean Encounter series, please visit hui.edu forward slash ocean hyphen encounters. That's whoi.edu forward slash ocean hyphen encounters. If you enjoy these events and would like to support the work of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, you can do so with a gift at hui.edu forward slash give. 
you might also want to take a look at the very cool merchandise um, at our online store, including updated versions of that hat you saw Peter wearing. That's at shop.hui.edu. And you get a 15% event discount for joining us tonight. Just type in the discount code OCEAN. Before you leave tonight, we have a very special treat for you. So please stay with us to see the short film Super Reefs, The Future of Coral, which features Anne and Anne Cohen, that is, and uh, some of her work. The film was produced by the Woods Hole Film Festival Film and Science Initiative in association with Northern Light Productions. And funding was provided by the Atlantic Donor Advised Fund. On behalf of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, thank you again to everyone and enjoy the film. are truly the rainforests of the ocean. An estimated nine million species from microbes to manta rays and thousands of types of fish. They're all there because of the corals. 500 million people around the world also depend on coral reefs for food, creating land, and protecting coastlines. Corals may even contain new medicines to cure age-old diseases. The problem now is that Earth's climate is changing very fast. The oceans are warming much faster than ever before. So the big question is whether the corals can adapt. Across the tropics, ocean warming is driving the loss of coral reefs at an unprecedented rate jeopardizing land, food, and lives. Some reefs, however, are defying the odds. There's corals that are, are living, are still alive here. We are finding some reefs that are not dying, that appear to be figuring out how to cope with this warming. But coral reefs are spread across a huge area of tropical ocean. So how do we know which of those reefs are resilient? What we're learning is that the corals themselves contain important clues. One important clue to how a reef will respond to future warming is how it has responded to past heat waves. What we do is we go out and we take a biopsy of the reef and we come home with a skeletal core. And to look inside the core, we CAT scan them. What we're looking for are these bright white bands called stress bands. These bands form when the reef is bleaching. Coral polyps get most of their energy and color from tiny plant-like algae that live inside them. When the water gets too warm, corals expel the algae, exposing their white skeletons. Bleached corals are essentially starving to death but some coral reefs are more heat tolerant than others. We found some reefs with absolutely no stress bands. These reefs should have bleached, but they haven't. In other cases, we found reefs that have bleached repeatedly over time, but they seem capable of recovering quickly. We believe that these corals are adapting. These coral reefs are what we call the super reefs, and they must be protected because they have the best chance of surviving. Every super reef should be in a marine protected area. No fishing, no dynamiting, no uh, dredging, uh, et cetera, all of the things that uh, destroy coral reefs. What's being done in Palau and uh, Phoenix Islands is a good model going forward for other places that we identify as hosting super reefs. By protecting super reefs, what we're doing is we're protecting the climate resilient corals. And those corals are gonna reproduce and their larvae are gonna travel on the ocean currents to far-flung neighboring reefs that have been devastated by climate change. And those larvae are gonna grow 
into small corals, they're going to grow into bigger colonies, and over time, that reef is going to come back. And it could come back more temperature tolerant than it was before. Many coral reef countries want to protect their super reefs, but we don't necessarily know where all the super reefs are. So the first step is to go out there and find them and then work with the governments of coral reef nations to incorporate those climate resilient reefs into marine protected areas. All our decisions have to be based on good science and the survival of coral in the future is under great threat. Now is the time to act, to ensure that coral reefs have a future. <laughs>